Uh, so instead we're going to do like uh, Spring and Kubernetes, uh, but it's really more like the JVM and Kubernetes. So hopefully you'll walk out today with a much better understanding of how to run Java workloads on Kubernetes in general. Um, just a quick show of hand, who here has used Kubernetes? Okay, who's never used Kubernetes? Okay, lots of people. So for those folks who haven't, I'm not going to do an intro, but it's not, uh, you are going to learn useful things. I, you don't need to be an expert at Kubernetes to actually learn and understand how this thing works, um, uh, like to follow the presentation today, okay? So ask questions. If I'm using terminology that you don't know what it is, just shoot, ask a quick question on, on that. Um, all right, so, uh, you know, I think from now on I'm just going to do beer and pretzels, you know? <laughs> I tried to find a picture of a really messy peanut butter and jam sandwich, but all those pictures were ones you had to pay for, because it's really easy when you're mixing, making a peanut butter and jam sandwich to get yourself dirty and, 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 and not have a good time. Um, so the way I've structured this talk is, is a series of questions, okay? So you want to run a Java app on Kubernetes, so you need a container. So what should you use as your base image for your container? Well, you get some, that basically boils down to three different questions. What operating system should you actually use to run your Java workload on? Uh, which version of Java should you use and which version of Java? So let's kind of break it down and go through those. All right, what operating system should I use? You know, you could go on there, you're going to find like Alpine Linux, CentOS, RHEL, Ubuntu, SOSE, Debian. Who here is using Alpine with your Java? Ooh, we'll talk about that soon. <laughs> you may not want to, unless you're using it correctly. Um, so, well, which one of those should you use? Well, it's going to boil down to knowing this really obscure thing about something called muscle libc versus GNU libc. So your C standard library on your, on your Linux environment is different in Alpine. So the GNU libc is what everybody, all the major distributions use, and it has bugs which have become features because they've been that way for... <laughs> for many decades, and, and applications may depend on the behavior of, of how the bugs work, so you can't change them. So muscle C is an implementation of the C standard library. It is you know, smaller than libc, uh, GNU libc, which is why it's included in Alpine. So Alpine Linux uses muscle C. So if you're using Alpine as part of your operating system image for any kind of workload, be conscious of the fact that unless you've changed something, you are getting muscle C and not glibc, which may work, but it may also not work, and when it fails, you may not know why it failed. You might just think that Linux doesn't work or Java doesn't work or something like that. So who here is using Alpine with muscle C? Okay, and have you had any weird things happen? Yeah, so, so there is a, if you click on this link, I left the link there for you, functional differences between glibc and muscle c, this is a bunch of stuff. Generally speaking, the creators of muscle c, like, you know, they've decided to do things correctly according to the C standard where glibc may have, you know, miscoded it incorrectly and for backward compatibility never fixed it. So just be aware of that. Uh, the JVM is, is a large C and C++ code base, so it may be affected. Having said that, there is actually a JEP called the Linux Muscle C libc port. That is not yet in any of the, of the, of the official JDKs. Maybe at some point uh, it will be there. It's been around since August of 2018, uh, 2019. So I'm hopeful that by the time Java 17 rolls around, uh, <laughs> we'll have this and we will have uh, an image that's maybe like five megabytes smaller than it, it would be otherwise, okay? Um, so that's, that's that part. Um, Is, has anybody put together a list of bugs to watch for? With, with well, the, the interesting one is there's a really good deep dive. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up. It's called uh, uh, Alpine Linux. Let's click on videos. It's this one here from DockerCon. 
And there are some fascinating questions at the end about differences when they ask the, the guy like, hey, will this ever be? He's like, no, this will never be fixed because glibc is wrong and you should change your code. <laughs> or in that case, the Python interpreter should, should account for the differences between the two. I mean, I, I can see over time more and more people will support it. So, uh, but it's just something to be aware of. If you're looking for stability, I, wouldn't, I personally would not use something that was using muscle C. Uh, just to, I have other bugs that of my own creation that I need to track down. <laughs> okay, so uh, what should you use? Uh, I'd say it's pretty safe bet to go with Ubuntu. Uh, it has glibc, and if you actually look at the Ubuntu-based image, it's really not that big. It's about 20 megs. 20 versus five on the cloud, I don't know. I'm okay with, with the 20 megs. Um, so use a glibc-based thing as a best practice. Okay, so we've covered that. So which Java should you use? So this is where life is fun. If you head over to Docker Hub, um, well, before that, who, who remembers this? Open JDK Docker image was just mislabeled. And so it's really actually important to know which JDK Java image you're pulling off of Docker Hub. So when you go there, you go on the, click on the checkbox that says official images only, please. And this is what you'll find. You're gonna find Jetty. Tomcat, Tommy, well, which one of those? They probably have a Java in them, right? But which Java, I don't really know. You can see, you can look on the details. I don't use any of these, so I didn't look at more of them. But let's look for stuff that says Java in it. So there's one that's from OpenJDK, and it's an official image. But I don't really know who builds it. It must be like leftover from before Adopt OpenJDK. There's another one called Java. When you click on it, you land on the OpenJDK one. You browse some more, and you're going to find IBM Java. Amazon Coretto, and Adopt OpenJDK. So if you, anybody here using Amazon Coretto? Just kind of curious, Not one person. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, the main difference between Amazon Coretto and OpenJDK is Amazon makes modifications to OpenJDK uh, that they've observed at AWS scale are useful to have. They try to upstream those, but it's possible that there are features in the Amazon Coretto that don't exist in OpenJDK. They won't be changes to how Java works, they'll be changes to the JVM. Maybe a different way that GC works or something like that. Um, and of course there's Adopt OpenJDK, which is kind of what I would recommend that you use. Uh, who's using Adopt OpenJDK today? Okay, so Adopt OpenJDK, if you don't know what it is, it's basically, um, um, like a non-profit sort of community uh, effort to uh, uh, basically make builds of Java, like gives you Java binaries. So the fun thing about it is when you go here, uh, if you click on other platforms, uh, you'll notice that they have 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, so they're always building a bit of everything. Um, they also give you a choice of a hotspot versus OpenJ9, which is nice. And they give it to you on Linux, Windows, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, different variants of Linux, Solaris, AIX, and I think you can even download it for the mainframe, uh, at least for some of those uh, things in case you have a mainframe in your basement and you need uh, Linux, uh, you need a Java for that. Um, so uh, with that, um, um, they basically take upstream OpenJDK. They don't make any modifications to it. What I like about it the most is it is hassle-free to use. So if on Mac, you can just do brew install, you can get that. And you know the whole thing with the TCK where Oracle owns the TCK and they will not certify you unless you pay the money and agree to their terms? So the way that they're getting around it is they got this interesting thing called the uh, uh, OpenJDK Quality Assurance. I would encourage you to actually watch some of the videos on it. It has a nice manifesto. Uh, like all things worthwhile in life, there should be a manifesto for it. Um, and uh, what it basically talks about is they're, they're saying, look, it's, we're done with the closed source validation. Uh, they don't have access to the Oracle TCK for Java. So what they do is they kind of assemble their own kind of maybe arguably better than the Oracle TCK TCK. <laughs> so they're including a lot of the open source uh, packages. So when they run their acceptance suites, they'll, they'll run like, you know, they'll test it with Spring, they'll test it with JBoss, they'll test it with all the major open source Java frameworks. If the tests of those frameworks pass, and they'll be like, well, this Java probably works. Um, and more importantly, they also have a nice API. 
So if you're writing like CI scripts where you need to reach out and get yourself a JDK and you don't want to click yes to accept license terms, um, it saves you one if statement in your, in, your, in, your, in your code. So I would recommend that you use the adopt open JDK base image. Any comments, questions about that? Yeah. Now when you go to use that, you're going to find that there are actually different versions of this thing. So mysteriously, if you go to well, not mysteriously. If you go to this guy here, you will see that it has an underscore in the URL. What that basically means is it's an official image. If you actually go to, uh, darn, escape. Uh, no, not this block. If we go to uh, this guy here, You'll see that there's, there's more like OpenJDK 13, OpenJ9, uh, OpenJDK 11. If I click on this, it says, see official Docker images for the regular JDK and JRE. So basically, an official Docker image is one where there's a bit of a, not an SLA, but like kind of expectation around how fast the people behind it are going to react to security. So theoretically, the Docker team is going to notice there's, an, there's a security issue. They're going to get in touch with the maintainers of that and say, please fix it, and all this type of stuff. Um, so in, in an effort to kind of slim things down, you'll notice that, well, latest is very obvious what that is, the latest kind of something. But there's a slim version. Well, And the difference is quite large, like 300 and, 324 megs versus 238 megs. So 100 megs less. So what's the difference between the slim image well, the slim image has things like the Java source code for the JDK deleted, the man pages deleted, uh, things that you don't need when you run on a server removed. Uh, so it's just the core of, of Java. So you could kind of use that if you want to save 100 megs of, of space. Uh, and then there's the Alpine image. However, the Alpine image uses glibc. It does not use muscle C. So they actually add glibc into the Alpine image in order to make sure that you're not running with your JVM with muscle C. So if you want to continue using Alpine, I would recommend that you use Adopt Open JDK Alpine rather than Alpine Alpine. Yes. So you are actually using GLIPC. So OK. Uh, any questions about the Docker images and the confusion about which one to use? Is it the answer? Adopt Open JDK is what you want to be using. Cool. So which version of Java should you use? Uh, the answer is 11, because it's the long-term supported release. Uh, later ones, if you want like less memory. So to Jonathan's point about why is it that Java uses memory, uh, more memory? Because you know when you're a garbage collector, kind of you start creating, allocating objects, and the garbage collector might take its sweet time to run because, well, you've got two gigs of heap, and you're only using a gig of it. And, and sometimes it wasn't returning it to the operating system. Uh, so that means the OS can't really like overcommit and a bunch of other stuff. So they're getting better at making Java work in a containerized environment. So I, I hope that we don't have to wait till 17 to get some of those. Maybe some of those features for containers will get backported into 11. We'll see. Uh, Ah, interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the optimization for faster startup is is a real thing, and it's a trend in the Java world. Actually, if you, um, I forgot to show you guys this, but the Spring One tour, like I said earlier, is coming to Toronto. It's sold out, but if you talk to me, I can probably figure out a way to get you in because I work for Pivotal, and we have 285 people registered, so it's probably like starting to get into like fire code. <laughs> size, uh, but one of the talks will be, these are the talks that will happen there, um, is going to be Spring Performance Games by Dr. Sire. So that will be a fun one to do. So Spring is actually much getting better and better faster at starting up. Uh, I think the next releases are going to do like compile time indexing with the annotation processors and that type of stuff. So uh, if you're on Java 8, you want to make sure you're on Java 8 update 191 or later. And I'll tell you more about that coming up uh, shortly. All right. So, so what base image should you use? 
bottom line is use Adopt Open JDK. Uh, if you, I recommend using the official images just because I'm lazy and I don't care about saving the extra 100 megabytes. Uh, caching will probably, of layers, will probably make sure it's not really an issue. So the JDK is about 400 megs, the hotspot GRE is about 219, and it's based on Ubuntu 18.04. So um, uh, you, know, you can use the other variants if you, if you want to. All right, so let's get into the fun, weird part. How do we optimize the JVM to run in a container? So you'll notice that the talk so far, a lot of it is actually not so much about Spring, it's about JVM on Kubernetes. So the question that we wanna do is how to get the JVM to use container CPU limits rather than the host CPU limits, and how to configure your memory well for the JVM. Who's struggled with this on Kubernetes? I know a couple people have. Um, if you haven't, you will when you start using Java on Kubernetes. <laughs> so um, so here's, here's basically the, the bottom line. It's actually not unique to Java. So you're a process running in a container. You say you're a Java prior to version 8, 191. You ask, you call the operating system, you say, how many processors do you have? And it comes back and says, 64, because you're running on a, on a 64 CPU worker node on the cloud. And you think, fantastic, I'm going to launch my fork join pool on the JVM, and I'm going to have 64 threads. 32 and 32 GC threads. <laughs> so not exactly what you want. Uh, same thing, if you're running Go code, Go has a, a Go max prox, which will say, oh, I have 32 CPUs instead of you know, the two that have actually been allocated to me. So if you have frameworks or code that's going to, to configure itself based on how many CPUs are available in the, to your container, you want to make sure you're using a, a later version of it, okay? Um, so the thing that's affected is this runtime.getrunTime.available processors. I have uh, some demo, but I've decided I don't feel like running the demo right now. You just have to trust me that it will give you the wrong answer. So let's talk more about, uh, this might be a short talk today because I'm feeling like I'm having a short talk. Uh, so <laughs> come back, come back. And I will be doing this talk again on Tuesday next week at the Spring One Tour. It will be longer and cleaner and less spelling mistakes and more demos. Um, afterwards. <laughs> Actually, no, the day before at the social. Um, so let's talk a little bit now about something that a lot of people are confused about. Actually, how do you tell Kubernetes how much resources your application should have? So here's an example on the right-hand side where you have a Kubernetes pod, which is uh, a thing that runs your containers. You can have multiple containers run on a pod. And within the containers, you have these two things called resource requests and resource limits. So the question is, what should you set those to? Should you make your resource requests equal to your resource limits? What are the units that are used? So Let's take a look at, at that. All right. So let's focus first on CPU. So the, the, the unit of measure you use in Kubernetes is something called millicores. So what is a, a millicore? It's one one thousandth of a core. Well, what's a core? A core is equivalent to a hyperthread if you're on your laptop or if you're on-prem on vSphere, hyperthread. If you're on the public cloud, they tend to be defined as one vCPU, which the public clouds, I think, define as one hyperthread. So it's one thread, okay? Um, and requests are kind of the minimum amount of CPU that your process is guaranteed, your container is guaranteed to have. And the limit is the maximum. So you can think about it as there are three cases. If you go and you say, if you look at this example here, my CPU limit is set at 1,000 millicores, so I, I'm guaranteed to have at least one virtual CPU. And I've said that the limit should never exceed 2,000 millicores. So when you submit this to Kubernetes and you say, Kubernetes, please run my pod. If it can't find a worker node with at least one free uh, uh, CPU on it, vCPU, it will say, I'm sorry, I can't run your pod because I, nobody has, I have no capacity in the cluster. Okay? If it does find capacity and you land on a node that doesn't have anybody else running on it or has lots of CPU, you're allowed to get up to 2,000 two cores on this particular uh, setup. Are you guys with me so far? Okay. So what happens if you set resource request equal to limits is you are, Kubernetes defines this thing called quality of service. 
Quality of service is not a setting that you say, hey, Kubernetes, give me guaranteed quality of service. It's more like Kubernetes will say, well, if you set your requests equal to your limits, you're telling me you want guaranteed quality of service. If you set your requests less than your limits, you're saying my application can deal with burstability. So if CPU is available, I'll let you use it. If it's not, I'll take it away. Does that make sense to everybody? Seems reasonable. Yeah, burstable in the sense of a load. It can pop, and then you're. Right. But we're gonna talk it, like there's implications to this, which is which is coming up on the on, on the next slide. Or you could be best effort, which is well, I didn't set any requests or any limits. So Kubernetes says, well, if you didn't ask set requests or limits, you don't care. So I'll do the best that I can to run your workload. So you might be like, should I really care about these? Well, yeah, you should, because it will treat them differently. So guaranteed is exactly what it says. If, let's say, the node, the worker node you're on is running out of CPU, there's lots of things running on it, uh, then you're not going to go below your request, and you're not going to go over your limits. You're guaranteed a certain amount of resources. If you have it as burstable, interesting things will happen. Well, you will get less CPU. Now, that's not bad because, well, guess what? Uh, it's easy for the operating system to take away CPU from you. Does that make sense? You're just going to suffer. Your threads won't get as much. If you do best effort, i.e. you don't set it, you could just get terminated. It'd be like, I'm kicking you off this worker node because, well, I only gave you best effort. You didn't ask for any re resource limits or requests. So you might all of a sudden find, poof, your pod is gone. That don't have requests on limits set on <laughs> that are running out. It's just the Linux out of memory for whatever. Okay, so uh, I gotta come back to that. There's actually two things that could happen. There's the Linux kernel, the out of memory killer, versus Kubernetes, kubelet doing stuff to you. Okay. So then the question is, okay. Which one of those should I use for my Java application? Should I do guaranteed, burstable, or best effort? Well, well it, the key thing here is when you go runtime.getruntime.getavailableprocessors, what I've tested this, and what I've noticed is that if you set, let's say, uh, your request to be, I want two cores, and your limit four cores, when you call available processors, it'll say four. Which is, which is kind of interesting. So we all know that in Java, on startup, what happens? The JIT is going, you're parsing class files, you're doing annotation scanning, so you probably want more CPU on startup. So you have this kind of trade-off. If you set the requests, CPU requests, and you set limits, let's say you're like, okay, I'm gonna give my, my JVM two cores, that, or, or like 0.5 cores, then what happens is that, well, it could take a long time for your Spring Boot application to launch or your Wildfly or whatever it is you're running because, well, Java takes more CPU when it's launching. So you're like, great, I want my microservices to start up faster. So I'm gonna give it more CPU so you increase your limits, but now you're wasting resources that you're paying for on the cloud. Does that make sense? So you're like, uh, what should I do? Well, what you should do is you should actually set your CPU requests, uh, but don't set limits. So if you set a limit, you're kind of saying my application is burstable, but you're bursting it up to some artificial value. If you set no limits, then you're like, you know what, but you set a request. This is the important part. You have to request a minimum amount of memory, uh, CPU, then you could burst up to all of the CPU that's available on the node. So if you're on a 64 node machine, you could use up all that CPU at startup. Your apps will start more quickly. So bottom line is, what you should do is you should measure how much CPU your application needs after it's warmed up. So what does that mean? Launch your JVM on Kubernetes, give it lots of CPU in an artificial environment, hit it with a lot of load and say, okay, when my application is in steady state, it should have one CPU or half a core or whatever much it does, okay? So that's what you should set as the CPU requests for, for launching your application. Don't set the CPU limits so you can burst up 
to all the CPU available when the app is launching. However, you may want to configure the XX active processor count explicitly. This way, you're, um, you don't end up with like, you know, requests that like, you know, get available processors will not vary. And I, I, I tried to like write a program to test what would happen if I kept calling get runtime um, uh, available processors in a loop while I was increasing the amount of load. So I wrote this little application to randomly encrypt strings that are being generated. And I managed to successfully push up my actual millicore usage up to the maximum for the pod, but I never saw the available cores change in the loop. Even though the Java doc says you can't count on it being the same between call invocations. So I could imagine a future version of the JVM actually adapting to however many millicores it's been assigned by a, a container environment. It does, but yeah, there was there was also a, a fascinating uh, talk uh, that I ran into from Zalando online where they looked at how the C groups are actually implemented, and and <laughs> it turns out that uh, you you if you get like a millic like say two hundred millicores, that means you have in hundred milliseconds you get twenty milliseconds of execution time, which may be it's in hundred millisecond increments. So if you uh, get your 20 milliseconds, but you only use like 10 milliseconds of that. Oh, well. <laughs> so I, I think, Jonathan, you'll probably really enjoy that. I'll, I'll, find, I'll send you the link. Uh, they ended up adding some features to Kubernetes to deal with it. Okay. So any questions about CPU usage in, in, in Kubernetes, what you should configure it to? You guys look really sleepy. No, so what I'm saying is set the request, which means give it a, a minimum. Your minimum should be what your app needs after it's warmed up. So if your app only needs half a core once it's up and running, once it's initialized and, and, and is the, the warmed up, then set your minimum request as half a core because you're always going to get that half core. So limit should never be set. Don't set limit. If you don't set the limit but you set a request, you, you're going to get the whole entire VM. Unless the administrator has set, this is, unless the administrator has set a range limit request on the namespace you're in in Kubernetes. And you guys are having like, who's feeling like their eyes are bleeding right now? Anybody? You can be honest with me. Kubernetes does that to developers. So I do this like Kubernetes under the hood workshop, which at conferences, which is a full day. And I warn people in the outline that it's an advanced topic and you should know about containers before you show up. And when it starts, I give people a chance to leave and scare them off and say, this is an advanced topic. You should leave now. I will not take it personally. And every session, two people leave at lunchtime because it's too much DevOps for them. Because <laughs> they're developers. They're like Java developers and whatnot. So this is kind of a not necessarily, this is the unfortunate reality of using Kubernetes. You have to know how it works. So you can't just use Kubernetes and not know how Kubernetes works. You will cut yourself. Um, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is why you may want to use some higher level abstraction. I don't know, like Cloud Foundry, perhaps? I still belong to three religions, Postgres, Cloud Foundry, and Spring. I am, I am contemplating whether to join the Kubernetes religion or not. Uh, I am not convinced yet. Uh, I may want, Kubernetes is great for Auto, like to build automation on top of. Uh, but you have to know a lot about how it works. So the question is, is there something in Amazon Coreto about how the number of available cores reacts? I have no idea. I don't know. Um, I, I've been just using Adopt Open JDK because it works on Mac OS and everywhere else. Uh, so RAM requests versus limits. So let's now take a look at memory. So we covered the case of CPU. What about RAM? Well, same exact kind of concept. So you have guaranteed, which is requests equal to limits. Burstable, if you, if you say in this example, my minimum is one maybe bits, not 10 to the 10, 10 to the 2 to the 10, right? Not marketing speak for megabyte, accurate speak for, for it. 
uh, and, and two gigs. So this basically means you can go from, you're guaranteed one gig, you can go up to two gigs. Not a good idea with Java, okay? And here's the reason why. In the case of CPU, if you burst out, it's easy to take back the CPU with nothing bad happening to your process. If I let you burst out and you allocate more memory, how does the operating system take the memory back after it's given it to you? It can't. So what it does is it actually restarts the process. So what will happen is if you have guaranteed, you get to keep all your RAM. If you have burstable and the, the node that you're on is running out of memory, your container will be restarted. And when it restarts, it will be now limited to less memory. So you have to be smart enough in your application to know that, oops, I got restarted because the node has had memory pressure on it, and so I shouldn't actually use the limit. I should just stick within what I requested. So it's not exactly something that I would recommend you do for Java. So for Java, you should always, always, always set the limit and the request to be the same. So you have a guaranteed amount of memory that you're going to pass to the JVM. Any questions about this? Would this be true for any garbage collected language? The question is, is this, is this true for any garbage collected language? Yeah. It's just generally not a good, like, like where this is not an issue is imagine if you have a container uh, that is in a pod, because a pod can have multiple containers. Maybe your container is like opportunistically crunching logs or something like that. And you don't care if it gets rebooted. It's running a lot of like, in the container there's shell scripts that are running processes that come and go, I don't know. That like Kubernetes tries to be generic and accommodate every possible conceivable use case, whether that's a common use case or not. So having this concept of resource requests and limits is actually not generic to just CPU and memory. You could say I want GPUs. Now, because Kubernetes is infinitely extensible. There's nothing you could not do with Kubernetes. You couldn't extend Kubernetes to do. So I was at uh, KubeCon last week, uh, which was my first KubeCon I've been to in San Diego. 12,000 people. Like, the show floor was insane. It was like 400 companies there. It honestly felt like being at the flea market. You can buy any software for any price to build anything you ever wanted. You just have to watch the YouTube videos for DYI on the internet, and you can do anything you want. Um, so, like, you know, you, you got to figure out how to corral Kubernetes to do what you want. So the, the bottom line here is, okay, great. So for my JVM, I should set memory request equal to memory limit. But then you have to make sure that your JVM doesn't go over the limit. What happens if you go over the limit? Well, you get terminated by the container runtime. So that means you have to convince the JVM, it's not the heap, it's the heap plus the metaspace, plus the code cache, plus all the other areas of native memory of the Java virtual machine that you never knew existed. So how do you actually calculate this? This is completely non-trivial. So you got two choices. One choice is if you are on versions of Java after Java 8, 191, you can pass this argument called max RAM percentage. This was added because prior to Java, what would happen is this. JVM would start up and say, oh, you're on Linux. I'm going to run in server mode. And I'm going to assume that I'm going to use 25 megabyte, 25% of the available memory on the Linux box for the heap. And remember, it was reading the heap from the host, not from the container. So you launch on a server VM with 200 gigs of RAM. And you take 25% of that, which is more than the one gig assigned to a container. And then you magically die at random moments because you didn't know that that was going on. So this max RAM, RAM percentage setting was added to Java 9 and was backported into 8. And its purpose in life, when you say 75, you're saying launch and please use 75% of the RAM for the heap and 25% for everything else. Code cache, meta space, all of that, please size yourself. Now, does this work correctly? I don't really know. Is that based on the container limits? Or that That's based on the container limits which is good. So at the very least, this is what you would want to put. I, that's what I've been putting with Java 11 personally. Max RAM percentage 75. And if 75 is not enough, bump it up or down. Anybody using that setting today? 
max RAM percentage? Just one person? A couple people? Okay. We didn't need to. I, I definitely ran into this before the container memory limits. Our spring apps were getting killed after about 2,000 requests. Okay. Um, and it was because Metaspace got bigger as stuff got compiled. Yep. But since the Well, I mean, you, if you're on 11 or 8, just it doesn't hurt to set this. Now, I'm going to show you a much better, more kind of interesting way to do it. So there's this thing called the Java Build Pack Memory Calculator. So Pivotal and on Cloud Foundry, we've been running Java containers for ages. And we have like a lot of empirical evidence on what's the best way to configure it. So this is all packed into, um, let's see. So there's this nice document here. You can go to... Okay, everything, all the gory details you ever wanted to know about how you should optimize the configuration of a JVM in a container. It's about 13 pages. So what I'm going to do instead is I'll do a quick demo of this. I do have demos, not all slides. Demos are, later on I have just talking point slides and all demos. So, because <laughs> I didn't have time to write the slides for those sections. Um, so I'm going to go to dev. Um, go uh, source uh, GitHub Cloud Foundry Java Build Pack. So the Java Build Pack calculator is actually written in Go, and I can invoke it like this. <laughs> and what you can do is you can pass it a bunch of parameters. So I can say, hey, Java Build Pack calculator dash dash. Um, you need to tell it a few things. You need to tell it the total memory. So let's, let's do that. And total memory is, I think, equal to, let's say, uh, 1G, okay? And I also need to tell it my thread count, which is interesting. You see, this one is factoring in how many threads you intend to launch, because that impacts how much memory you need for the JVM. Uh, thread count, let's say, 50, all right? And I need to also tell it how many classes I'm going to load because that impacts the, um, the cache, uh, the, the, code, uh, the code cache. So this is the loaded class count. How did you get this number? Which one? The loaded class count? You would have to empirically pass some command line arguments to the JVM. Or you have to have something like the Java build pack that can actually count this. You can just count the files because it goes through stuff. Okay, So you pass it this stuff, and out comes this command line argument. It says, these are the Java options you should use with your JVM, and we will, you will have a good time running your Java code in the container. So you would probably want to integrate the memory calculator into whatever CI pipeline you have that would factor that in. Or perhaps use Cloud Foundry, or perhaps use something like the build service from, from Pivotal, which do this. Okay. Questions, comments? Is there a good reason JVM doesn't do this automatically? Question, is there a good reason why the JVM doesn't do this automatically? Well, the answer is it hasn't been built in, but this is the kind of thing that you, like you saw with the X, the memory RAM percentage. This was done in response to JVM running containers. So again, I would expect that over time, uh, the JVM will, in fact, do more of this type of sizing automatically for running in a container, but it's not there yet. Right? It really is, remember, the JVM was born back when we didn't even use virtualization. <laughs> we had big boxes with lots of CPUs and cores, and we just wanted to run lots of things on it. So if you, if you set the limit of the RAM limit low, yeah. um, it, your app might run, like what you want is it's okay if your app gets Java laying out of memory exception. That's fine. What's not good is if your container gets terminated. What's even worse than that is if your worker node gets completely full and then the Linux kernel picks some process and it randomly shoots in the head. So generally speaking, 
you can, like in Kubernetes, let me show you this uh, real quick here. Uh, you can say get nodes, okay? So this is the command you use to ask Kubernetes, tell me what nodes you have. So I'm running just Docker desktop, so I have one node. But you can say Kubernetes describe for me the node Docker desktop. And you're going to get a set of conditions. Can you guys see that in the back? Oh man, this is, you'll see one of them here says memory pressure, disk pressure, PID pressure. These are all like kind of a Kubernetes deciding how much is happening on there. Um, and you'll get down to a section here where it'll say, okay, the allocated resources. So for CPU, it's allocated 200, uh, two, 200, 2,750 millicores, so 45% of what this virtual machine can handle. And it's got total limits maybe over 100%, i.e. overcommitted. Generally speaking, it's okay to be overcommitted on CPU. Do not overcommit on memory. You have to like, bad, bad things will happen to your clusters if you do that. So again, some folks will implement what's called the mutating admission hooks into Kubernetes, far more advanced topic than we have to cover today, where you can make sure that your developers don't randomly, um, uh, like things don't get overcommitted. So uh, going back to uh, this guy here. So in summary, how should you run a JVM in, your, in Kubernetes? Make sure to set minimum CPU requests equal to the actual uh, at steady state warmed up what your JVM requires. Set your memory requests equal to your memory limits. And uh, maybe consider that the way you want to scale up is by saying, you know what, I'm going to test my app within a two, gig, two gigs of RAM or one gig of RAM. If I need more, I'm just going to scale up more um, uh, replicas. And you have to kind of like figure out the right balance between number of threads and amount of RAM and what your app actually does. So empirical evidence and measurement is how you figure these numbers out. Uh, will people write AI machine learning stuff that does this? Probably. I'm sure there's vendors that sell this today. Okay. Wow. So that was uh, a lot of DevOps, right? <laughs> can, I, can I get a raise now? I'm a DevOps engineer. Uh, all right. How to optimize image size? Now that we know that, well, what about the actual container images? So let's take a look at this. So here's, let's go to a demo. So here I've got a, a Java application, just a Spring Boot app. And if I go into, let's just open up, see target, ah, no, let's see, message service target. Okay, so my jar file is 72 megs. Why is my jar file 72 megs? Well, let's unzip it and see. Um, so if I do tree on here, you'll see that there is, in my Spring Boot app, I have a boot app, I have a classes directory where there's the actual code of my application. Then there's a lib directory where there's the third party libraries that my application depends on, okay? If we look at, if we go into the lib folder, uh, lib, is it no, boot inf, I think. Uh, du dash h. Okay, so it's, that's where my 72 megs is coming from. So if you have more things in your application, your jar file is going to get bigger. It's not like I've, I've had jar files be roughly about 100 megs or a little bit over 100 megs. Before you start blaming Java, who's seen how big the Go statically linked binaries are? North of 100 megs is not unusual when you bring in all the dependencies. You know, it's, it's a fact of life. 20% of the code we write, 80% we pull in from from other people's code. All right, so what can we do about this? What's the implication of this? If we go to, say, the Spring Boot Docker, and we go to the guide here, I'll show you, like, you can see the easy way to represent, to write a Docker file. You might have something that looks like this. 
you know what, copy my jar file into the container, and that's that. The problem with doing it this way is every time you change your code and you build a new container image, you're going to create a new layer, which is 100 megs. Say you have a team of 10 developers, and they each make a commit, two commits a day that they push, and that goes onto the CI server, and the CI server builds it, you're going to start using up a lot of space on your container registry. Now, if you're running an on-prem container registry, that could be a problem. Some people will start screaming at you for using up too much disk space, or they'll start trying to expire stuff. If you're running on a public cloud, the, you know, the public cloud will happily take your cache for, for using up the disk space. Why not, right? Um, but we could do it better. So let me show you the better way to do it. So here's my, my way of doing a more efficient Docker file for your, for your, for your stuff. All right, whoa, you guys should tell me that my fonts are horrible there. Huh? Oh, I, I, I don't know how to use the, those things. I have to change my font. Um, let's do this. How do you do a reverse pinch? Like, that sounds like... That doesn't work. How? All right, come on, show me how to do it. <laughs> what? Wow. Oh, well, okay, but I can't. Well, hold on, hold on. I have to master this. All right. Jeez, I can't do it. <laughs> okay, hold on. Wow. Okay, no, no. So, okay, so show me again the hand. No, no, stay there. Show me the hand motion. Don't press it hard push. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Okay. For the first time since uh, I bought a Mac in 2007 or something, I now know how to do Thank you. I've learned something today. All right. My consultancy $250. $250. Sorry. Um, Oh, that's good, thank you. Um, so this is here what is called a multi-stage Docker file. Who's, who's seen one of these bad boys before? Okay. So what's happening here is in a multi-stage Docker file, I'm basically saying from, and I'm using the adopt open JDK, and I'm using the uh, JDK 11, and I'm calling this thing ex as exploded. So what I do is I copy my fat jar into the container and I call it app.jar. And then what I do is I create a directory called app. I go into that directory, and I extract the jar file. So now that I've extracted that jar file, I now start the, the this is actually what I want to be produced. So I create a, an adopt open JDK. This time I use a GRE hotspot. So I'm actually getting a smaller image. And then I create a temp folder, I create a, uh, I go and set my working directory to be app, and you can see here the first layer I copy stuff into is the lib folder. So between compiles of my code, I shouldn't actually end up changing my class path. It's unusual that I would change my class path every time I run Maven build or Gradle build. So that will give me more caching, get more cache hits. And then I copy my uh, meta inf and I copy my actual classes into it. Does that make sense to everybody? So this is going to make my layers, my, my images consume less space in the container registry. And things should be a little bit faster, which is great if you have lots of these to do. Uh, do I need, no, you could, I tried to do this with Alpine, but the problem I ran into is unzip that is built into Alpine with BusyBox can't handle a fat jar. Like it, it just errors out, says it can't read it. Because it's not really like completely implementing all the features of the zip file format. And then I tried like installing like a real unzip and I couldn't figure out the magic incantations of which packages were required. So it was either that or run Ubuntu and then do like an Ubuntu install. And I'm like, you know what, it's faster to just pull a larger OpenJDK image that can unjar something than to pull a base image and then install packages into it. 
I could make my own lighter weight one, but I'm like, I'm too lazy. Yeah, this, this, this works. Yeah, trust me, this took like four hours to write this. <laughs> huh? Sorry? Sure. I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to make this, put this on GitHub just because, but I, I need to refine this a little bit more for my Tuesday presentation at, um, at the Spring One Tour. So a couple other things that you should probably do is switch your user to nobody, nobody, which is better than running it as root. Uh, and you can see here what I'm doing is uh, I'm saying, okay, uh, X show Windows VM and set my RAM percentage to 75%. And then I just set the other stuff on here to be, uh, to be the um, whatever it is. Like this is the main method that you should start. So you guys uh, make sense for how to do this? Okay, cool. Glad you guys learned learned something. Uh, all right. So that covers that. So now that we've got that part figured out, the next question is, all right, Spring Cloud Kubernetes. So let's actually see some code now, some Java code. Um, so all of that stuff before was applicable to running workloads on the um, uh, with any with the JVM. This now is all about well Spring Cloud Kubernetes. So this is a project from Spring Cloud. I'm just going to steal the slides from um, All right, you know what? I'm just going to show you a demo. <laughs> this is what I wanted to show you here. So what Spring Cloud Kubernetes does is you add it to your Spring Boot application, and your Spring Boot application is going to actually talk to the API server directly, and it's going to do magical things for you. Um, I'm going to show you some of those magical things. I'm not convinced that I like this project yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh crap, this is recorded. I'm a uh, scared. Huh? Why? Because it's talking to the API server? Yeah. But that's what you're supposed to do with Kubernetes. The problem is Kubernetes uses etcd. Oops, bad choice. Well, etcd will be made faster because, well, there are billions of dollars being invested in Kubernetes these days. As, uh, as my friend Stu likes to say, the bonfires of VC money are growing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so. Uh, no, I'm talking about uh, like everybody else. Uh, CD. Okay, so I'm going to go to uh, what am I going to? Yeah. Okay. Is the font big enough? Okay. So I'm going to go to uh, yeah. VM samples. Uh, CD. Spring Cloud. Okay, so here's my project. And let me actually start by running the application first so you see what I'm doing. And you know what? I can't zoom everything. So I'm going to close this because I forgot the pinch technique already. <laughs> and I'm going to do it the old school way. Um, so we're going to go to. No, I want to change the, I want to change everything on the preferences. So just give me, give me a second. This will, this will be easier for me. Size 16, fly, okay. You guys see that in the back, or is it still too small? Johnny, it's all good? Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is I'll run the app first locally so you see what it is. My app has got amazing, like, the world's best user interface ever. It's also the world's best hello app. So the concept is you have a billboard, like you know those electronic billboards, like where Patterson does stuff. So you can tell me if I'm this competes with you or not. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a message service that I can run, and it's going to serve out a bunch of codes. So my message service application, standard Spring Boot application. So I ran Eureka first which is the Netflix uh, Eureka server. My message application has launched, and it will launch on a random port. Um, well, this doesn't look um, 
let's go to this guy here. Okay, this is basically what it does. Every time you reload it, it's got five coats in it. Okay. And there is a front end client for it, which is called the billboard client, which has the world's best JavaScript ever written by me. <laughs> the longest JavaScript program I've ever written in my life is in this application. And this one will, in fact, run on port 8080. It says loading. And then it just does an AJAX request to load up that. So that's basically all that the application does. The, this hello world is effectively divided up into two microservices. One microservice is the front end needs to call the back end in order to pull back the request. So you guys, everybody knows what this, what's happening here? Let's look at the code for that. So typically in a Spring Boot application, um, we have the billboard controller. I have a REST template here. And in my REST template, I say, go to the message service. And you'll notice this is, there's no DNS name for message service. What it's actually doing is it's going to, uh, in the application controller here, I'm saying, hey, look, I want a load balanced REST template, which basically says, if I run multiple instances of my message service, it will go and it will do client-side load balancing. And it will invoke, invoke that. Who's with me on what this app does? Now, if you don't have Kubernetes, you need a service registry like Eureka. If you are on Kubernetes, Kubernetes has this concept of Kubernetes native services. And that's something that would allow you to do load balancing between those things inside of Kubernetes and not require something like Eureka. So what we're able to do with the Spring Cloud Kubernetes project is we're able to um, deploy our code to Kubernetes and not make any changes to it. So I did not make any changes to the code. Well, I made changes to the POM file. What I did is I went in and I added this Spring Cloud Starter Kubernetes All uh, because I was too lazy to add five other POM files. And what will happen is by adding this code to your class path, you can now, uh, Spring Cloud Kubernetes is going to automatically determine that you are running in Kubernetes, oops, and will then know to activate the Kubernetes profile. So you have your regular application YAML, which is what it's gonna run locally. You have this application-Kubernetes, and this is now saying, when you're inside a Kubernetes cluster, please apply these extra configurations. Who's with me on that? So that's actually quite, quite useful feature of this. Um, so you'll notice here in my local machine, I set the port number to zero because I wanted to randomly pick a port. But on Kubernetes, I actually wanted to run on port 8080. And I disable Eureka in Kubernetes. And in my regular one, Eureka, I disable Kubernetes <laughs> service discovery. Otherwise, Spring will complain. Okay. Um, so that's that. So now that I've got this, I've baked these already into images, so I, you don't have to watch me do that. Um, so let's go into this k 8 directory here, and let's learn what it's like to deploy an application. Oh my goodness, I'm running out of time. To Kubernetes. So I have a, uh, what's called a deployment. And in this deployment, I have to write all this YAML. Uh, I'm telling it that I have a container, and this is what I wanted to use. Uh, I want port 8080. Remember my resource request here? So in this case, I'm just setting it to uh, 1,000 millicores and one gig and one gig. We'll talk about liveness probes and readiness probes shortly. I have something that's called a service. And the service in this case is what's going to do the load balancing. So let's, let's just go here and uh, CD message service. Okay, see, you get all what's on here. Uh, Like my services are there. Let's do KC delete deployment message service. Let's start from empty KC get deployments. Uh, all right. So now I can say, uh, Kubernetes, please apply the deployment out dash F. 
Oh, I'm in the wrong directory. This is where my, okay, so QC apply uh, dash. Okay, there we go. Uh, now the best part of this presentation. This is fantastic program called K9s. Who's using this one? Uh, well, this is uh, basically just a GUI <laughs> interface for Kubernetes. Huh? Yeah. Um, so right now, you can see that my, uh, it's kind of like eating up a lot of this stuff, but you can see information about it. So my, my, my pods, my, I have two containers for my message service. They're all up and running. And uh, you can see your logs here, which is kind of nice. Ah, don't scroll out, I hit escape. And here's the best part. I can go here, I can hit S. Yeah, I'm in a shell in my <laughs> container. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's pretty handy. That's pretty handy. So I can go in here, and you can see here is where, uh, like, like this is the actual file system as the container sees it. Should you guys ever, as a Java user group, decide you want like a really intense deep dive on how containers work, where I get to like make containers that have one file in them with no Docker involved or anything? Let me know. I can I can do those demos for anybody interested. Just a single Go binary. It's fascinating to figure out what the world looks like if you're inside of a container as opposed to, you know, a VM. Um, but if I go into my app folder, uh, this is where I have my you know, application Kubernetes YAML, my bootstrap, my all the stuff that was in the fat jar that I expanded earlier. So we'll, we'll, we'll exit that. Okay. Now, uh, going, uh, going back here, how am I going to access this? Okay, so I have to say Kubernetes get services. So because I created a node port service, you can see that Kubernetes has done this magic and said, if you go to port 30,734, I'm going to send you to this particular IP address, which is going to magically, through the magic of Kubernetes, load balance between the two, the two uh, pods. So I'm going to do that. Oh, I can just do it here. So if I do curl localhost. Oh, look at that. I actually got a code. Okay. If I take this guy here and let's go to over here and do that. Okay, I've got it in the browser. If I do actuate, I can't spell this word. Um, God damn it, they picked like, there's two words I can't say, actuator and plural. <laughs> Those are the two words in the English language I can't deal with. Um, so if I go here to this one, if you go to the info endpoint, uh, you're going to see a couple of extra interesting things that Spring Cloud Kubernetes is giving you. It's going to tell you uh, information about your pod IP, your um, host IP, your namespace you're in, the pod name, service account that you're using. So kind of useful for troubleshooting. Now, technically, if I reload, I would actually expect it to load balance between this and the other pod. I just can't get that to work. And I think that's because I'm using Docker Desktop's Kubernetes rather than a real Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and you have to like go look at the IP tables and check the IP table chains, which I ran out of time to actually troubleshoot. Um, so that's another thing that it does here. Does that make sense to you guys? All right, so now let's actually uh, deploy the second part of this. So I'm going to go in out of the message service and into the billboard client and go into my K8s here. And now here I have another deployment. Uh, this one is going to deploy the billboard client. Uh, all right, so okay, see so get pods. So you can see now I've got my billboard client is now running. Uh, get services again. So I have another service, which is a node port one. This is on port 3208. So if I go to localhost 3208, 
I am now hitting the billboard client running inside of the Kubernetes cluster, which is then making calls via the Spring REST template to the message service, and it's now using Kubernetes load balancing to do that, rather than using Eureka. So same code base works. You can make it work outside on your laptop and on, on that. So that's one of the things that it does. Um, there's one other thing that it does that's pretty handy, which is uh, config maps. So if I go here to uh, foo, it's just a controller that I put in there. So let's take a look at that. Um, in my message service here, I've got a foo controller. And all it does is it says, read me the value of the property called foo. Well, where is foo coming from? If we look in our application YAML, it should say foo is value from application.yaml. But that is not what it says here. Okay? So what you can what it's doing is um, Okay, Kubernetes has this thing called config maps. So I created a uh, Kubernetes config map. Let me show you what it looks like. Uh, CD message service, CD Kates, cat config map. So you can see here in this config map, I said I have a, a key called foo whose value is value from Kates config map. So if I do KC describe config map, uh, uh, describe, come on. Okay, you can see it tells me there's a key called foo with the value called blah. So by creating a config map with the same name as the application, you can get, you can read through regular spring annotations, you can actually read those values. Does that work with secrets too? It works with secrets too. And, but this is why it's actually connecting directly to the API server. Now you can still inject secrets with like in the YAML and go like you know the the deployment YAML and they just map it. You can still do that. But do you have to give the app like a special service account to be able to get secrets through the API? Uh, yeah, you you would have. That's why I created a service account so it can actually connect and do stuff. Now what you're supposed to be able to do is I'm supposed to be able to do the following. Like say I do vim uh, config map. Dot YAML, and I go here and I say, like, I want new value tjug, and then do, um, and I go in here, and I refresh this, I should actually see this new value. I couldn't get that to work, because I think something is wrong with the permissions on my service account. Um, well, it, it, so basically what it does is you can say Spring Cloud Kubernetes reload, by default it's disabled. So you have to say enabled equals to true, and then you can say what you want it to do when it detects that there's a new value. Because Kubernetes API server has these thing called watches that you can do. Anyway, if you want to see that working, come on Tuesday. <laughs> I'll have it working by Tuesday. <laughs> Version of this presentation, all right? So you guys getting a sense of what Spring Cloud Kubernetes does? All right, so interesting project to look into. Um, you can do pretty much everything Spring Cloud Kubernetes does without using that project. That's why I'm like, said I'm not sure that I would want to use it, because there are alternatives without including that extra stuff on the cross path. Um, well, this one won't. Uh, yeah, 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 I know, I see what you mean, yeah. Well, you can give it a service you, you, can, you can restrict, but you have to be more, more responsible. Sounds like yeah. more work. It is, yeah. yeah. It's. Like you could do more work to have that convenient. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I would say that like this is a pretty early project, version 1.1, wait till it gets better. I don't like the fact that it pulls in Fabricate and then that blows up my class path with a bunch of other stuff that I don't need. Um, so if you want to know more, watch this video from Spring 1. I left the link in there for you. Uh, by Ryan Baxter. Okay, last topic, and uh, liveness versus readiness probes. Okay, this is something that people get confused about. Five minutes? Okay, I'll do it in less than five. Um, so we're gonna take a look at 
what the heck is a liveness probe, what is a readiness probe. So in Kubernetes land, a liveness probe is how Kubernetes determines whether your container is up. And a readiness probe is um, how it determines whether, ooh, can I, let me try. Ah, I had to practice that. Ah, okay, I'll do it later. By touch. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm too heavy-handed for this. All right, you guys will have to live with the, with the small fonts. So a liveness probe is what determines whether your container is alive. What Kubernetes will do is, if the liveness probe fails, it will restart the container. Okay? A readiness probe is whether your container should receive requests from the load balancer or not. So let's consider the following scenario. If I go back here to my, um, where was the other one, Twitter, I go to health, okay, you have like, you know, your health check. So I have my database health check and I have some other health checks here like a custom one, history, experience, whatever. So let's say my database is down, my MySQL is down, my Postgres is down. If you include the health check, the actuator health check in the liveness probe, Kubernetes will restart your container. But your database is still down, so that won't help you. Your liveness probe will fail again, and Kubernetes will restart you again, and you'll restart too many times, and you get into what's called a crash loop back off, and boom, you're dead. What you want to do is if your database is down is you want to remove yourself from the load balancer so you don't receive any more requests. Does that make sense to everybody? Which is why... It's complicated though, because the database liveness probe might fail if you've got a connector pool leak, and then you do want to be Well, but that's, that's why what I'm doing here is you just have a regular endpoint, like in here I have a regular controller that is... Um, uh, called my health controller, no, liveness, it just says okay. So that would tell me that, okay, my JVM is up, I can get something. If I was out of threads, that fails, it gets rebooted because the liveness probe failed. And the readiness probe is the one that's actually checking, it's actually checking the, uh, crap, where is this here, um, that my health is correct. So if the re pre uh, readiness probe fails, I don't get any more traffic. Now, if you want to take it a step further, you should actually write a shutdown hook that will fail the readiness probe when your pod gets terminated. Because when your pod is being taken down, you want to process whatever requests are coming. You get a SIG term. I didn't have time to get all of that worked into this demo because I literally finished writing the slides as I stepped out of the Uber in front of the Free Times Cafe. As always happens when I do presentations for the Toronto Jag, uh, I run out of time preparing. So that's, I hope today was educational for you. Who's surprised at how non-trivial it is to run Java on Kubernetes? A couple of people. It yeah. <laughs> it would have been had you not already tried. Kubernetes is incredibly non-trivial, incredibly. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a... Uh... Yeah, I'm impressed you have it on your computer. Oh, everybody does now. When you install Docker on Mac, you, 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 get... you need Kubernetes now. What? You just get one. Okay. If you don't want it, it's a free program. Well, yeah. okay. so it's hard to not have it. The, the final bonus hint, who's, who uses, who's seen this site? Who's using it? Okay, who knows what this does? Who doesn't know what it does? Okay, this is your best friend ever. What this will do is, this is so you can use in your JUnit tests, you can launch containers which have databases in them. So let me see if we can find uh, uh, test containers. Just look at the docs, maybe the docs will have it. So imagine now you're writing a, um, so 
in your unit test, you can say at test containers, at container, MySQL, and what that will do is it will actually launch a Docker container on your laptop with MySQL in it, or Postgres, or Cassandra, or Rabbit, or any of these types of stuff. So this is designed to make your life easier when you're writing integration tests to run on your machine. It's better than, which is not really a test for anything, because I belong to the Postgres religion, and H2 is never Postgres, even when you set the flag to say, pretend to be Postgres, because you don't have stored procedures and all the other cool things that Postgres has. Wasting a day of your life on making your apps compatible with H2 so it will pass the test. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I, uh, I, there's a really great presentation. Uh, if, you, if you do Google search test container, click on videos, and uh, there is a video from DevOps UK, which is from May, which would be this one, which is a fantastic, you know, full hour. I, I, I think that uh, somebody here should volunteer to do a talk for the jug on test containers in April. <laughs> No, uh, I, I, am the, I am the backup speaker. <laughs> I am always the backup speaker, guys. I am the speaker when there's no other speakers. So. Sorry? Does it? Oh, does it? So, so the test containers will basically work with anything that has Docker. There's kind of like pre-baked in classes for kind of commonly used stuff like Kafka and Rabbit and all of that. So which graph database are you using? Huh? Neo4j? Well, Neo4j, you shouldn't need test containers because it's a, just a Java process. You could probably run it embedded in memory in your, in your, Spring, in your JUnit test. Okay? So uh, Spring Boot has good integration with these test containers and all this type of stuff. So you could be like, I don't want to launch a Docker container for each one of my you know, test methods. I want to do it. Generally speaking, like I think we really should have a talk on JUnit 5 with test containers and get into a debate over like, you know, should you have unit tests or not, integration tests and you know, all that stuff. Okay, thanks guys. I've gone way over time. So have a great day. Bye.